behavior trees. This video is about us understanding what behavior trees are, how they came into being, and what are the advantages of using behavior trees in robotics. This series will start with the conceptual idea of behavior trees in this video, and in the next videos of this series, we will actually start coding in C++ to build a behavior tree. Okay, enough about the series, let's come back to the idea of behavior trees. To understand behavior trees, let's go back to a time where we did not have behavior trees, but FSMs were the main thing in robotics and game engines. Let's also understand what behavior trees and FSMs are in general for. They are ways to structure and manage the switching between different tasks in an autonomous agent, which could be inside a game like a virtual entity or a robot. But let's talk about FSMs first, and that will lead to certain problems. And then that will lead to our discussion about behavior trees and how they started. What exactly is a finite state machine? Or as we said, FSM. An FSM or finite state machine is an abstract machine with finite number of sequential states. This sounds very boring and full of jargons. So let's just simplify this using an example, okay? Now, imagine a machine, for example, your computer. In a very simple scenario, your computer can be in two states, on or off. So this will be a state machine for that. And this has two states. So this is a finite state machine. Here, one state depends on the input, which is a button press. And in this case, we'll simplify it to a toggle. And then also it depends on the previous state. So that's why it's sequential. So it depends on the previous state and the input given. Now, this was a very simple example of a finite state machine. You can of course go into the details of finite state machines because what I've explained is not actually exhaustive. It's a very simple watered down idea of a finite state machine. Now, I hope you've either understood the idea of a finite state machine in simple terms, or you've researched about finite state machines already in the past. So let's look at a more evolved, but still very simple finite state machine of a robot. This robot is supposed to find a ball, go to the ball, pick it up, then go to a bin and drop it in the bin. And the process repeats. This is the state machine of that robot. Spend a couple of seconds understanding what the state machine is. As I said, the state machine has finite states and it is sequential. That means that the current state depends on the previous state and the input. The input is given through sensors and the previous state is of course the previous state. For instance, let's say the first state is finding the ball. If the ball is found, we go to the next state to approach the ball. If we've approached the ball, we go to the next state, which is grasping the ball, and then we go to the bin, and then we drop the ball, and then the process repeats again. But during this process, if there is a fault somewhere, then the system should ask for help. So this is our state machine for the simple robot. Now, we were talking about finite state machines and you might get impatient and then you'd ask, why are we talking about this? Well, before behavior trees, finite state machines were ruling the world of game engines and robotics, but it had a couple of problems which led to the creation and usage of behavior trees. Looking at this FSM, we are happy because it seems to work well. But there are two problems with this state machine or this finite state machine. One, reactivity and second, modularity. Let's talk about them individually now. First up, reactivity. Now, the problem with the state machine is that let's say an external agent comes when our robot is supposed to drop the ball to the bin and it pushes the ball out of the robot's hand. What will the state machine do in that case? It assumes that nothing like that will happen. What we need to do here is that we need to make our state machine more complicated for complicated scenarios, right? So we can do that. We can add an additional state or we can upgrade the state which is place ball so that it constantly checks if the ball is still there. That's still fine. But in a real scenario, there are so many complexities. As you increase the complexity, you would need to have more states. That's still okay. But you would need to handle each state with a lot more intelligence. And then one state might not lead to another state, but it might lead to five or six or n different states, depending on how complicated the system is. So we can take one of the paths. Now, as we make the system more complex due to requirements, Making a finite state machine becomes super hard because you will have so many corner cases, you will have so many issues. So the problem is a practical finite state machine, which is understandable for us and we can debug it properly, is not reactive enough. And of course, the more corner cases you have, the more intelligence you want to put in a finite state machine, the more complicated it will get. And we as engineers might not be able to deal with it. So in simple terms, you might make a mess of your state machine if you keep using finite state machines for a complicated scenario. A practical state machine is not reactive enough to react to these corner cases and complexities in the system. Second, modularity. Now, one state here in this finite state machine is actually not decoupled from the previous state and the next state. For instance, grass ball 
is supposed to be connected to approach ball and approach bin. In this case, what's happening is that if for some reason you want to use this state again, because the system is getting more complex and you want to grasp ball not just to approach the bin and put it in the bin, but for something else as well, you cannot use it as it is because it is not modular. It will have code which at least indirectly depends on the previous state and the next state. So that means if we want to use the state or the code inside the state again, we cannot do that. We will have to make changes to this code to check if the next state is this or that, if the previous state is this or that. And as I said before, as these things happen, the system becomes more complicated, it just becomes a mess, and thus a state in itself is not modular. These are the two main problems with a finite state machine, and a finite state machine starts failing practically for development and deployment once the system starts becoming more complicated. It's great to use a finite state machine if the system is very simple and then if your environment is constrained and predictable. But because of the previous two issues, we can say that in general, as the system becomes more complex, a finite state machine is not scalable. So that is the problem which led to the creation of behavior trees. So now after all the story, we're finally talking about behavior trees. This is the corresponding behavior tree of your state machine. It might look slightly random if you don't know what's actually happening. So what we'll do is we will understand different components which together form a behavior tree. We'll also check if this behavior tree is doing what we want, but with reactivity and modularity, right? Because these were the two reasons which led to the creation of behavior tree. So let's start with understanding the basic building blocks of behavior trees, and then we'll come back to this behavior tree and see what's actually happening. A behavior tree is a directed rooted tree which has internal nodes called control flow nodes and leaf nodes called execution nodes. A behavior tree starts its execution from the root node using something called a tick. A tick is basically like a nudge to a node where it'll start functioning. So the root node actually starts this tick or this nudge and it nudges all the nodes just below that. So all the children of this root node and this nudge or a tick is gradually propagated. A node is only executed if it is ticked, otherwise it's not. Also, ticking in behavior tree happens from left to right. So depending on what the parent node is, it will either tick only the left node or all the nodes, but we'll get into that in a bit. In general, there exist four different categories of control flow nodes, sequence, fallback, parallel, and decorators. A sequence node is a control node with children where it actually starts ticking from the left node and then it gradually moves towards the right. But the catch here is that a sequence node ticks its children starting from left to right until it finds a child node which returns either running or failure. So a sequence node actually requires all the children to return success for it to say that, hey, I am successful. And when that happens, it will return success to its parent. Note that when a child of a sequence node returns running or failure, then the next node or the next child node to the one which returned this is not ticked. So it is only ticked if the previous one returns success. A fallback node, on the other hand, routes these ticks to its children from left to right until it finds a node or a child node which returns either success or running. If all the child nodes return failure, only then is this node saying, hey, I failed. Otherwise, it will return a success or running as soon as one of its children returns running or success. Note that for a fallback node, if a child returns running or success, the next node is not ticked. So the status is returned back to the parent node, which is the fallback node. And this fallback node reports back to its parent saying running all success. A parallel node routes ticks to all its children and returns success if M of these nodes actually returns success. It returns failure if N minus M plus one nodes, where N is the total number of nodes, return failure. And otherwise it returns running. A decorator node is an added functionality on a child node. For instance, if you want to allow the child node to fail N number of times, then you can add a decorator node to basically enhance its functionality and say, hey, you can fail n number of times. Now, talking about execution nodes, there are two simple types of execution nodes. One is action and one is condition. Action node is responsible for carrying out an action and then it returns either success, failure or running. And a condition node checks for a condition and returns success or failure based on that condition passing or failing. Now, let's combine all of this and look back at our example where the robot was supposed to find a ball and then finally drop the ball in a bin and the process repeats. Looking at this behavior tree, the root node is a fallback node. That means it goes to the left side of the tree, which is our main tree, and the right side is asked for help. If the left side returns running or success, then the right side is not used at all, right? So the right child, which is asked for help, is not used if the left tree returns success, that is, everything is done, the ball was finally dropped in the bin, 
or it returns running, which means the root node has to wait anyway. Now going down the tree by one, the next node is a sequence node. That means it wants to tick all the children one by one. And when all of them return success, only then it's happy and it returns success back to its parent node, which is the root node. If not, it'll either return running based on what the children are doing. If one of the child returns running, it'll return running back. Otherwise, if one of the child returns failure, then it will return failure. And then we'll go to ask for help. Now let's go to the next level. We see this level filled with fallback nodes again. That means this fallback node will first tick its left child. And then if the left child fails, only then it'll go to the right child. Let's just take one example because it's just repetitive and it's the same for all of these fallback nodes. Now let's take the extreme left side of this. Here what you have is a fallback node which has two children. One ball found condition node and second find ball action node. Ball found condition node just checks if the ball is actually found or not. If it's found then it returns success. That means this part of the tree returns success to its parent which is a sequence node. So it'll basically take the next one. But if ball is not found, then this fallback node will look at the next child, which is find ball. If find ball returns running, then this node will return running back to its parent node. That means the system has to wait until this running is changed to either success or failure. So this node constantly takes ball found and the action node, which is find ball. And then once the ball is actually found, this will eventually return success, right? Because the condition ball found becomes true. So ball found returns success. So once this is done, the sequence node, which was the parent of all these fallback nodes, takes the next fallback node, which is about approaching the ball. The same logic is applied there. And hence all the fallback nodes from left to right are ticked one by one. Now, one thing to consider here is that this is a reactive behavior tree, which means that all the nodes to the left of the currently ticked node are also ticked. What does that mean in this case? And why did I say that this is a reactive behavior tree? Let's say in this case, the ball is grasped and then the robot is moving towards the bin. Somehow an external agent pushes the ball away from the hand of the robot. Now, in this case, since all the nodes which are on the left to the node we're talking about, which is for approaching the bin. Since all the left fallback nodes were ticked continuously, as soon as the ball slips away, the ball is visible, but the ball is not close to the robot. So the second fallback node comes into play here. Now the robot will again approach the ball. So in this case, the behavior tree is already pretty reactive. That was not the case with a finite state machine. If something like that happened for a finite state machine, it would have failed. So we would have to make changes to that finite state machine to consider this example or this corner case, but then you have so many corner cases. So this is one example where reactivity is clearly there. That's why I was saying a behavior tree is reactive, but a finite state machine is not. Talking about the second advantage now, modularity. One module or one subtree of this behavior tree is actually independent of all the other. It doesn't know where the tick is coming from. It doesn't know which subtree was ticked before. So you can actually reuse this again and again. And let's say you have to grasp the ball again and again in different scenarios. You can use the same subtree from the behavior tree instead of doing something else, making some other changes because subtree is decoupled from all other subtrees or different parts of the trees of this behavior tree. So that solves our problem of modularity. Now, because of reactivity and modularity, the idea of behavior tree is very scalable for complicated scenarios and complicated systems. That is exactly why behavior trees came into being and that is why they are used so much in robotics and game engines now. So this was the basic idea of behavior trees. I hope you understood what a behavior tree is, how they came into being because of problems with finite state machines and what are the advantages. There is a lot more to understand when it comes to behavior trees. I'm adding a link to the book I read, which is all about behavior trees. It is a brilliant book. This video just covers the basics and there is a lot more to understand. Now in the next video, we will code a behavior tree from scratch for a simple example using something called behaviortree.cpp, which is an open source library for making behavior trees. This is a brilliant, brilliant library made by Davide. And I absolutely love this library. So we're gonna talk about that library. We will start making a simple behavior tree using that library in C++, and then we'll take it from there and then gradually build upon that to make robotic behavior. Thank you for watching this video. I'd love to know what you think about this and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.